Welcome to the Exodexa podcast. I am here with my favorite co-podcaster, Nolan Bushnell, who needs very little introduction to most of the world. He's either the guy that introduced you to video games or the guy that kept your kids from doing their homework uh, when, <laughs> when they were doing video games. So happy to be here. And today we're talking about something that's uh, really exciting to me. We have started a Founders Circle so that... Uh, a little few more of you can get to know Nolan a little better, and uh, and so Nolan, welcome. Well, you know, and... it's it's more fun to get to know you, Leah. You're much more interesting than I am. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for that. But I think that uh, well, I told my mother about our book that you know everybody was going to be buying the book because of your name on it, except her. She bought it because my name was on it. <laughs> but I think the Founder Circle is a great opportunity for us to build a community of like-minded people. I, the response to the book has been really wonderful. People are excited about what we're talking about and, and interested in the kinds of change we're suggesting. But it's going to take a community to do this. It's not going to be just a few people or just one company even. It is going to take a community. And so our the Founder Circle is our opportunity to build that uh, community. Yeah, and I mean, we you will know, do it. The, the first world, actually, almost every country in the world spends 6% of their GDP on education. And some people are getting good for that, that but... But no matter what you say, that's a massive amount of every economy in the world. That's just a really? real effort. It is. And now it's looking at how we're doing it, how we're spending it. I mean, I talk all the time about the fact that we have a version 15 of the iPhone, which has only been around about 15 years, and we're still using basically the same version of public education that we were using when it was launched. And I think... It's really time. The pandemic showed us just how little it's working for the kids uh, outside of school. And in school, it's it, there's still a huge struggle. Not everybody's good at the kind of learning that we expect in a classroom. So changing the system might be the answer to keeping more kids in. And having the Founder Circle is our opportunity to have people come and meet with you once a quarter for office hours where we can talk about all this and also like that is also the community that will be the first group to test the game out. Yeah. Right? I think you, you saw there was a, there've been a couple of tests already with the game and I'm really excited by the response that we've had from the kids, especially the second test. I, I sort of threw somebody in there at our executive producer, Kevin, who I knew did not like games that have any narrative to them. He wants to just get in and play and find other people in there. And, and uh, so it took a while to talk him into doing the play test. His dad convinced him it was a good idea. He could put it on his college uh, application resume eventually. And, and so he agreed to do it begrudgingly. And at the end of the test, he went to his dad and he said, you have to tell me as soon as the next level is available because I really want to know what happens next. So he was, it's not that he hates the reading, he hates the boring reading. He, wa he was happy to engage in the narrative of the game when it was something that caught his attention. And I think that's what we're missing in education, is finding a way to catch the kids' education and have them want to be in that chair. Well, you know, <clears throat> sometimes we are fighting a philosophical problem as well. Sort of part of our history, we were wound up in this Calvinist philosophy that anything of value is struggle, you know, and that anything that is fun is whimsy and, and of, of, of little value. And what I believe and what we're trying to accomplish is, can we make learning fun so everyone wants to be a lifelong learner. And, and I think that that not only does things that are good, but it, it changes some constructs that I think have been part of the, the, the world psyche, you know? I agree. I think that there's, a, there's an undertone of, of why do we have to make it 
enjoyable. It's education. They're there to learn. And I actually, there, yeah. I was at a conference in San Francisco and, and one of the sort of godfathers of the uh, computer science world was the speaker at the time. And he was like partway through the weekend. And there had been a lot of conversation around gamifying education and, and making education more enjoyable. And that was, he got up and the first thing he said was, I don't like all this conversation about making education enjoyable. I think that education is education and kids go to learn. And if it's fun, fine. But if it's not, they're there to learn. And and I felt like it was such a grumpy old man okay. way to look at it, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> if we if we can engage the kids, if we can make it fun, they'll they'll want to be and they'll want to be there longer. And how do we expect lifelong learners if we make learning miserable? Exactly. And uh and I think too the the whole idea of engagement and uh, well, I found that when I was engaged in something, learning it was really important to me. Like I was into ham radio early on, and as a ten-year-old, all of a sudden they wanted me to know calculus, and you know. And that was so far, you know, I hadn't even had algebra yet, but I wanted to get this ham radio license. And so I said, well, I think I can plow through it enough. And I can't say that I really got facile at calculus, but I kind of got an idea of what was going on. And that really helped me later on when I was in engineering. Right. Well, I, you know, you just brought up an interesting point too. Like, is it important that everybody become expert at everything? Or is it important for us to have a base understanding of the things that are not in our wheelhouse, but are important in the world? And then a deep, meaningful understanding of the things that we are really interested in and really good at? Because nobody's gonna be good at everything. Yeah, and, and you know, there's this 80-20 principle that it takes 20% of the time to learn 80% of a field. and you know, the rest of the, you know, 20% or the 80% of the time to learn the last 20, you know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> and, and I do, I, I think that for entrepreneurship, it's absolutely critical to have a diverse amount of knowledge because what you really want to do is synthesize disparate things. And so the more disparate things you have, um, is good. I mean, I, um, I'm really grateful that I became obsessed with beer drinking in college uh, because because I dropped out out of engineering and went into business because I couldn't do all the homework for the engineering curriculum. And you couldn't because it would interfere with the beer drinking, I guess. Huh? Exactly. You know, I, in business school, you could you could beer you could drink beer and, and get along quite fine, but engineering no no way and so i had i had a, a, almost a full year in in the business school in, in economics and um and then went up and finished in in engineering and it turned out with my life i uh, I, I i like to say the uh, engineering gave me a key that opened the door but when i went through it i had to use my business skills that's so true, isn't it? I mean, the business education is going to be helpful no matter what career. If you're an artist, you still have to understand the business behind your art. Like you, you have to make a living. So understanding the business side is important. And that's, you know, yeah. we're probably going to get some kickback from some of our MBA uh, listeners and viewers about this uh, beer drinking and business school, but we'll, we'll leave that for another conversation. <laughs> but I think what you're saying also in the founder circle, having a variety of talents, like having people from a variety of walks of life that have an interest in this subject matter, the group will be better than the individual. It will help us guide this. You know, and, and I'm wondering if we could talk some of the founding circle members into being an ad hoc mentor or, or have a master class. Because, you know, 
let's have say somebody is really good at commercial real estate. I think mm. having a master class for, for the kids, you know, doesn't have to be an hour. It could be a half hour. It could be 20 minutes. But yeah. just talk about commercial real estate to kids. You never know what that extra little knowledge or talk about a direction could could go to. And I'm not, I'm just saying it could be pharmacy, it could be being a doctor, could be an attorney, could be, uh, you know, and then there's, you know, in, in attorneys, there's litigation and there's, there's uh, patent law and, mm -hmm. um, and that business law, just, you know, how do you set up a corporation? What, what's a corporation all about versus an LLC? You know, all this stuff is a domain expertise that I'd re really love to have a cadre of people that we could tap into. That's a really good idea, Nolan. And it fits into the, you know, you, you can't be it if you can't see it. A lot of the kids that we work with, they don't have anyone in their lives who is a doctor or a lawyer or, or a commercial real estate, any of these professions. So being able to give them examples and, and hear from people who are, and, and I think that our founder circle members will probably fit a lot of those uh, categories. I spoke to a medical doctor this morning who, who joined the uh, Founders Circle, uh, has two children in school and is really passionate about education. He said, I, I want to be part of this. Excellent. Well, you know, just think about how many kids who are going to school, but they don't consider themselves academic. But I'd be willing to bet that, that they would it would blow their mind to say, okay, you get a real estate license and then you show, you take people on house tours and then you sell a million dollar house and you get 3%. Not bad, you split right? The commission. Yeah. yeah. You say, so I sell one house in a year and I can make a whole year's salary. I bet I can do that. <laughs> Right. You know? right. And a lot of kids just don't even know that that's an option. So I like your idea. I think that it's a, uh, I think it's a very good fit for Exodexa. We want to have a platform that offers you know, a really helping kids with career readiness and with uh, their academics and just helping them become well-rounded lifelong learners when they leave school. Well, I, I was, I was very focused on being a tech head, I, I, I really wanted my kids to have technical skills. And, and I think that really ended up helping them. They, every one of them can program and uh, a couple of them made their, their living as game designers, really. And in fact, I, I think all five of them on some level, slightly different nuances. Uh, right. Well, that's um, and you know they they grew up with uh, I, I think it was Fast uh, Company magazine. It said to the first family of fun, and I think that's absolutely <laughs> correct. <laughs> so they grew up with that as a as their life experience, and watching you in that industry and knowing your story had to have had some influence on their career choices. Well, I used but the to girls take them didn't. To, I used to take them to the trade shows. And ah. they would just have so much fun. Um, well, they'd see everything new coming out. Wonderful. Lucky boys. And all awesome girls. guys. I... Yeah. <laughs> the whole family having been... I mean, it's part of the motivation really when we started writing the book, Nolan, and in working together. Is I feel like anybody who has raised eight kids who are as amazing as the eight you have know something about kids and add, take what you know from games and add it into what we're doing with uh, education. And I mean, the, the idea for us is game forward, right? Game first and add the education in. So make it a game that kids want to play all the time, not just at school, not just because they have to, to learn, but because they're really engaged in the story. And well, you know, Leah, also one of my touch points was the idea of having a rich environment, not mm -hmm. financially, 
but stuck and, 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 you know, hot glue guns. And so what you're doing with the foundation, I, you know, I think you should talk a little bit about that and what kind of, you know, using industrial discard and, uh, and, and teaching kids to be makers. I think that's an important step that I, I don't think you've elaborated on this other skill set you have. Thank you. Well, yeah, I think, you know, there's a graph that shows how much we remember two weeks after an experience. And what we read, we remember about 10% of. And what we do, I mean, there are other, you know, what we hear, when we hear and see all those, like there's a little bit of a, a growth pattern there. But when you get to the top, the most of what we remember, 90% two weeks later, comes from what we do. And what we do is when we're making something, when we're giving a talk to someone, when we're engaged in a game, a video game that is, we remember those things because we're fully engaged. It's, it's what we're doing. So the foundation, we build maker spaces and that's part of the, the joy of, of like our entree to uh, the schools is we're already, I'm already in the schools with the maker spaces, over 300 now in LAUSD schools which is more than uh, half of the schools already have one. And our goal is to make sure they all do eventually. And, and helping those teachers that we work with in the maker spaces move from lecture style teaching to learning by doing. Because the other thing we know from research is that kids don't pay attention to what adults are saying. They'll sit in the classroom and if they have to, they'll listen while you're talking, but they're not as engaged as they would be if it were a peer up there. So Having, I mean, this is when, when chat GPT was introduced. I said, well, this is, you know, the beauty of this is we don't need to have teachers spending their weekend grading papers. They can uh, have the kids present their papers to the class. We'll know whether they learned what they, what they were writing about in the Q and A period. And uh, that will eliminate a, some of the drudgery for the teacher's job. So I think in both the foundation, what we're trying to do and what Exodex is trying to do is make the teacher's job easier and make the student's job easier and more enjoyable and make the student's job far more engaging and enjoyable. I, uh, and I think that uh, we are in the swim of massive change because I, I really do believe that AI is a powerful tool that can transform a awful lot of human activity to be more productive get rid of busy work. Um, I was reading an article the other day that said that uh, 90% of uh, customer service is going to be, you know, sped up through AI. Wow. But now you're going to get satisfaction through AI and not have to be on the, you know, on hold for two and a half hours to get a customer service representative. You know, then things like that, which, uh, you know, do we, is it a giggle to be having to call up customer service? No. <laughs> nobody you know, wants to. I, I would like, <laughs> nobody wants to do that. And so exactly. if we can facilitate it on some level, that's a good thing. And, and then people will say, well, you know, what? What about the poor people that are losing their job? What about all those customer service representatives? And I like to say, well, you know, what happened to all the telephone operators? Did you know that in, in the 30s, one third of young single women were employed as telephone operators? Really? You can't one stop third. technology. <laughs> yeah. Now, those those one third went somewhere, but they're not they're not you know answering the phone now. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it opens up to other possibilities and other interesting job training and that sort of thing. Well, I think we've yeah. sort of exhausted this one, Nolan. And thank you for uh, for your time today, to all of you who have been uh, listening or who are watching this after the fact. We uh, thank you for your engagement and go to the website and join the uh, founder circle. It only costs a dollar. We aren't doing it to raise money on that one. We are doing it to raise a community because it will take a community to make the change that's needed in education. 
and just so you know what the dollar is about, we don't want any bots. We love people, but we don't want bots. And it turns out that, that a dollar separates the bots. Evidently, bots don't have any money. Okay. Thanks, Nolan. Bye, everybody. Okay, thanks.